is not associated with the lack of time in, in camp? Yeah, looking back, you know, talking to Greg, a couple of those misses we don't attribute to lack of preparation time. We thought that we followed, you know, his post-surgery protocol right on the money. I know a lot of people didn't see him kick during training camp because we didn't with the group, but we did a lot of kicking post-practice, just kind of slowly ramping him up. And we got some operation kicks the last couple of weeks. And I, I just, I don't, I don't see that as a factor that he missed, you know, the 31-yarder and the PAT. The 60-yarder was kind of a Hail Mary field goal, but the two for sure makeable ones, he, he, just, he just missed. Nothing wrong with the operation or wind or anything? Nope. Operation was good. There's no wind. He just, you know, you could dissect it down to the bone. And he just, the first 31-yarder, he just, he just mishit it, pulled it left. And the PAT, he hit it pretty good. He just pulled it just a little bit left. So nothing to attribute it to other than just a, just a miss. Does that go the same way? Is there a mechanical flaw that he has or his plant leg is above or behind or anything like that? Yeah, no. I mean, we, like I said, you know, we were in the film room today, then we were doing it on Friday, and um, Greg came in on his own on his, on his off day just to work out a few things. But he said he, the 31 yarder, he hit it just a little bit high, which led to the pole. And same thing with the PAT. There wasn't anything um, alarming or uh, lack of experience or lack of preparation wise that had him miss the kicks. He just, I wish I had a better reason why than just to say he just missed it. But, you know, I, I made a bad call. He missed a kick, he missed a block, missed a tackle, you know, dropped a pass. Those things happen, Does unfortunately. Does he normally miss left when he, when he misses? Is it normally to the left? Uh, I would I'd have to go back and look, but I'd say probably because he's such a powerful kicker. You know, a lot of the balls that miss right on a right-footed kicker, maybe you kind of guide it or kind of just float away from you. But a lot of his are like powerful kind of pulls. Um, so, yeah. How do you assess kick coverage this past game? Yeah, it wasn't it wasn't good. Um, we were the goal was to compete in the kicking phase. So you know, three balls we purposely put in play. I told Greg to kick it down about the goal line, and he did great kickoffs. The first one we covered real good. We got him at the twenty. And the whole goal was to just get him as far back behind the twenty-five as possible with their quarterback. Um, and I think we just ran out of steam, to be honest with you. We had a lot of guys on kickoff that were playing quite a few snaps on defense. And the competitiveness probably got the better of me on the third one, where they got out to about the 40. Um, I felt like we were losing a little bit of gas because the guys were getting a lot of reps. And probably should have kicked a touchback, just knowing that you know the guys were starting to get pretty tired at that point. But um, competitive, competitiveness got the better of my judgment, probably. Um, but there's also one of the, one of them I could have done a better job on. You know, I put a guy in a bad position that kind of cost us. And I told the team that this morning. I said, you know, I raised my hand. I said, I screwed that one up. But I'm not going to apologize for competing. So that was the thing I also told them. How do you gauge that you know, late in the game, whether or not your guys in coverage have played too much on defense? Because some guys can handle it and other guys can't. How do you know when you would be pushing too much by kicking it up without a touchback? Yeah, I mean, just by looking at them. Like, you know, Dorrance Armstrong and Basham, um, Leighton made a take off of it. You could just tell. I mean, it was, it, was, it was pretty warm, and they were just sweating, and they were gassed, and I, and I could tell. But, you know, you get into a football game, and you want to compete, and you think we kick the ball and play, and we'll tackle them at the 22 or draw a penalty and put the ball back at the 12. Or, you know, like happened a couple of years ago, you know, we kicked it in play, and they brought the ball back, and we forced a fumble, and it was the end of the game. So um, some of those experiences lead you to say, let's kick this ball and play, you know, and, Go take it away and end the game because <laughs> it's happened before. You know, then you look back, it's like, ah, damn, I should have hit a touchback because it got to the 40. So, damned if you do, damned if you don't. But, um, but the guys want to compete, and so that was the goal. If the kick ends up going to about the goal line, is it a safe assumption on our end that you have said, hey, let's force a return here? Or are there times where they miss hit it and you, you end up in a coverage situation? Yeah. Our kickoff cover guys always or assuming we're covering. And I'll tell Greg sometimes, I'll say, hey, Greg, you know, go ahead and bang it. And I'll say, hey, put this ball in play on the goal line. And the kickoff guys really sometimes don't even know because their assumption every time is this kick's going to get covered. Because sometimes I'll say, hey, Greg, let's bang it. And he might, you know, tow it a little bit and the ball comes into play. So I never tell the kickoff team, hey, this is a touchback or this is ball in play. They just are assuming they're covering. And we'll tell Greg kind of 
our thoughts on where we want the football. Left, right, short, deep. So uh, we, need, we need practice time on kickoff, to be honest with you, because you can't simulate kickoff practice in practice. And none of our guys covering those kicks really got any preseason reps on kickoff. So take some work. And I can do a lot better. Can you take us through that uh, very last play of the game? And how do you go about picking the players that were the 11 that were on the field? For that yeah, no, that's, a, that's a great question. Um, we put it in, honestly, about four years ago, maybe five years ago. <laughs> we, we, we practiced it probably once a week for four straight years. We've, the situation has never come up. Um, we did put it in, practiced it once last week. And then in our walk through Thursday morning, there's a hundred special team situations that I could cover, but I just can't cover them all. And we covered two of them. And one of them was just, hey, guys, you know, it's never happened before, but if we're in the end of the game situation and we're out of Hail Mary range and we need a touchdown, you know, this could come up. So let's walk. So we actually walked through it Thursday morning. Um, and it's we basically just take our punt return personnel, where the best runners, the best athletes, the you know, best blockers. We put all 11 on the field, and really we just ran a punt return play, to be honest with you. You know, we had to snap it to put it in a play, but we blocked it like we would a punt return. Um, Back. Yeah, the ultimate goal is to get as many yards as we can with the first ball carry, which was Tony. And then um, we wanted to get it down our sideline, but we wanted to just keep it in play. So we told them, you know, anybody that's about to be tackled, lateral it to certain guys we have in position to lateral it to. And Tony did that, but I guess they called him down just before he got rid of it because said was the next man. And then, um, and then it turns into some backyard ball from there, to be honest with you. But the goal was to get the ball in athletes' hands, um, not go down with it and try to just advance it as far as we can. And you never know. You could, you know, a lot of times when those balls are in play, you get a face mask penalty or something that would give us 15 yards and an untimed down and gives us a crack at a, you know, another 60-yard field goal maybe. So that was the goal, to get as many yards as we can and hopefully draw a penalty and then get an untimed down. Before that play started, you, it seemed like you gathered guys around and were kind of showing them something. Were you showing them the play as it always had been in terms of what you guys had practiced, or were there any changes to the play? No, no changes. It's just such a unique situation. Like I said, I've had a card with me for four, four straight years. <laughs> I've never used it, but I've always had it on game day. So it's just, uh, hey, remember, this is the position you're in. This is where we're going with it, and this is what your assignment is. Because it's hard for them to exactly not remember, but they just need a reminder. So coach called a timeout, had the card. Hey, guys, all right, here we go. Um, and if it was week eight, where we had you know eight more weeks at running it once a week, we probably have been a little bit better at it. But um, but for the first game of the season, you know, took a crack at it. Damn. You mentioned after a walkthrough in the ballroom that morning, right? Yeah, we did it on Wednesday in the in our mock game, and then we did it in the ballroom Thursday morning. And it's I told the special teams guys this morning I need to stop with this stuff because um, it seems like everything we think of the, the last second to to review one more time it actually happens. You know, I've never walked through that play before in the ballroom. And for some reason, we walked through it in the ballroom, and first time in four years, we're in that situation where we got to run it. So um, I also told Zerline, we were in Arizona in the preseason game two weeks ago, and I told the whole team, all, all the special teams guys in the ballroom the morning of that game about an experience I had when I was with the Raiders with Janikowski. We played the Cardinals back in 2009, and Seabass missed a field goal in the first quarter. And he missed a field goal in the second quarter. And then we're down by one point with four seconds left in the game. And Seabass, Janikowski, is lining up for a 31-yard field goal with four seconds left. You guys can look it up. And he pushes it wide. And we lose the game on a game winner. And he missed three field goals in that game. Um, and I was telling the guys this a couple weeks ago in the preseason game in Arizona that one of the worst experiences a coach happened that day. And Seabass was just crushed. He puts your arm around his neck. You say, hey, man, it's going to be all right. you know. The very next morning, Seabass is back in our Oakland facility, and he's out on the grass on his own, real foggy morning, about 7 o'clock in the morning. And he's just going up and down the field, just, just kicking, you know, just to um, rehabilitate his brain, I think. And I walked out on the porch. I didn't go out there, but I saw him kicking. I said, man, what a, what a tough thing for him to go through. But there's no better medicine than just going back and kicking. And this morning, I told Greg the same thing. Anyways, Seabass ended up, that was the first year he made the Pro Bowl. After that game, it was week four. 
he missed three kicks in that game. You can go back and look at it. I was on the sideline and I was I was crushed and I sharing their pain. Um, I don't think he missed a kick the rest of the season, and that was the first year he got voted to the Pro Bowl that same year. So I told Greg, "Hey, Greg, you know, Sea Bass's tenth season. This is Greg's tenth season." I said, "This is the way it's going to go. You know, you miss a kick, you miss a kick. You know, you miss a big hail mary kick. Um, get back out on the grass and keep swinging and watch what happens." So, so obviously, your job as coach and just your personality in general is to to buck up the confidence of the person who has missed the kick or whatever mistake or miss yep. or whatever. But what about for the unit as a whole, for the whole team? Because it's so deflating. So how do you build up the confidence of the rest of the team in the kicker or whatever happens? Yeah, I don't think I have to do that. I think the guys believe in Greg. I mean, his history should give them a ton of confidence that he'll bounce back. You know, Greg had the surgery in May. His wife and five kids went back to their home in Nebraska all summer. Greg stayed out here the, all 12 weeks. I mean, he rehabilitated and sacrificed his whole summer with his family to, to be here to get himself prepared for this. So um, the guys know that. So just that, they believe in him. You know, if a guy isn't working or isn't rehabbing or is late or is sleeping in meetings or doesn't show up, yeah, that's the problem. But when a guy sacrifices his whole summer with his family to rehabilitate his back, to do everything he can to be ready for this game, you know, it doesn't it didn't go his way, but um, I think just preparing the way he did gives the guys hope and belief. Like this is our guy, man. This is our guy. The lack of preseason time at kickoff with your guys is that something that, looking back, you would change, or in future years you'd want to change, or is it easier said than done to get that sort of time with the actual personnel that you end up using week one? Yeah, I mean, you'd love to get the reps, but um, you know. Dorrance Armstrong in the preseason, was getting, well, he was starting on defense. And to put those guys out there in a preseason game, you know, covering some kickoffs, I, I don't think the risk is worth the reward, you know, injury-wise. You know, there are some teams that put some of their starting special teams guys out there and got hurt. So I don't think the risk is worth the reward, even though now you say, you know, a couple more reps might have, might have helped us. But, but then you have a guy that gets himself hurt in preseason, you're like, oh, damn, why do we put him out there? And, you know, we didn't need that in the preseason. We'll be all right. So, um, but yeah, the more reps, the better it would help. Um, we didn't – any of our phases on special teams against Tampa Bay, we never got one rep in a preseason game with that unit on the field at the same time. So, we'll get better. Uh, I have no doubt. You know. Last one. With uh, Ryan Cox in particular, their uh, debut regular season. They were sharp. Yeah, Jabril had a real good game. He played on all four phases. Nation was on all three phases. Um, we got Simi out there, for Hoko on a couple plays. So it's just a developmental part, which I think is great for those guys. And just like last year, you know, Rico didn't play as much at the start. McKeon didn't play as much. But as the weeks go by, you know, their, their volume will increase just based on attrition. And so getting them a little bit of early work, you know, will be good for them in the long run. Thanks, guys. Thank okay, thanks.